So now we're going to talk about when we have two samples and how do we then compare these two samples. Usually that's what we do in statistics is we have two different samples or two different populations and we want to know, are they different? What is so different about them? Or how do they compare? Comparing one with the other, we want to know more about them. So we want to actually ask the question of are two populations different? So as an example, you might want to say, is the average height of men taller than the average height of women? Of course, we know it is, but you know, you might want to know how much taller. Um, you might want to know if the mean is weight is less after diet than before. That's actually something you wouldn't know and you would want to find out. Um, are houses in Phoenix cheaper than, than houses in Flagstaff? Those of us who live in Flagstaff think yes, but can we have proof of it? Do we actually know? And can we actually find out how much cheaper are they? And so these are where we can compare populations by comparing the means or by comparing the medians or by comparing how much variability they have. You can do all these different values and you can compare these populations depending on what your question is. And what you do is you can take a sample from each population and compare the statistics from those different samples. So what we need to figure out is how did we actually collect those samples? From those populations. So if you want to compare two populations, you need to know if your samples are collected in such a way that they're what we call independent samples or if they're what we call dependent samples. And depending on how you do that depends on how you actually analyze them. So that's why it's really important to know whether or not they're independent samples or dependent samples. So let's talk about what the difference is between these. If you choose one sample and that sample has no effect on the way you choose the other sample, two samples are called to be independent. This is kind of like that idea of independence and probability. Another way to think of this is that that means one, a value in one sample has no effect on any values in the second sample. And as long as they're that way, then we'd say that they're not related or they're, they're not paired with the other variables from the other sample. And those are what we call independent samples. If, however, you choose a sample so the measurements in one sample are in fact paired with measurements from the other sample, the samples are what we call either dependent, matched, or paired. This is often like a before and after situation. You want to know before weight and after weight. You know that person. You know how much change they actually have. So you can talk about the change in the before and after values. The way to think about it is, is that in dependent samples, a value from one sample affects the value from the other sample. Um, and so we actually can say that the values from one sample are what we call paired or matched with the values from the second sample. And what we mean by that is that that means that we can talk about the difference. How much change was there from before or after from one sample to the other? And so it's very important that you understand that what we're going to do in those is we're going to look at that change. You can't look at that change for independent samples because you don't have any way to say that this value belongs with this value and we can subtract them. You can't subtract individual data values in independent samples because they don't belong with each other necessarily. But in dependent, they do. They're matched together, they're paired together, and they belong. And we can actually talk about how different they are and how big that difference is. And to, the way we analyze matched or, or paired samples, which we call dependent samples, is what we, we call a paired t-test. And so again, we're gonna find that difference between those values, those values of the variable. Because if you think about a paired sample, you can have one unit of observation, whatever your unit of observation is, you have that unit of observation, which is the rows in your data sets, and you have certain columns in that data set, and you can actually subtract two columns if it makes sense to subtract them. And you can do that because the values are paired together, they're attached together, they're from the same unit of observation. So we're going to look at how we do a two sample paired t-test. Um, you do use the mosaic package for this. Um, as with every hypothesis test, you're going to state your variables, your random variables and your parameters in words. So you can have two random variables. You have the random variable from your sample one and you have your random variable from your sample two. So you're going to label them. Um, you're gonna have your mean from your random variable one and your mean from your random variable two, your mean from population one and your mean from population two. And again, you just write these in words. You don't know what these values are. 
and you're just going to write down in words what they are. And it's very important so you know if you're going to compare differences, which one you're subtracting from which. Then as with every hypothesis test, you then state your null and alternative hypothesis and your level of significance. Usually we're looking at mu1 is equal to mu2 is your HO. Your HA could be mu1 is less than mu2. Your mean from the first one is less than your mean from the second. Or your mean from the first is greater than your mean from the second. Or your means are just different. So depending on which one of these you want, you'd look at those. We can do a slight little tiny bit of algebra. This is like the only algebra you're going to see in statistics is you can actually subtract mu2 from mu1. So you get them equal to zero. And so it's actually kind of important to understand that that's what that you're looking for. You're looking for that HO is that they're not different. There's no difference between the means, which means they're equal to zero if you subtract them. In your alternative hypothesis though, would always be either you're less than zero, if mu1 is less than mu2, you're bigger than zero, if mu1 is greater than mu2, or you're not zero. So you're comparing with that zero value. Since we are in fact finding that difference, normally we stop here, but we can also think of that difference since they were paired together we can actually call that difference mu1 minus mu2 equals something called mu sub d. And that's just the population mean value of those differences. So the hypothesis becomes mu sub d equals zero or mu sub d is less than zero or mu sub d is greater than zero or not equal to zero. Remember the zero equals zero is your HO. The other ones are all your HAs. Um, you're gonna state your um, significance level here just as a state of doing. Okay. Then the next step, of course, is to state and check the assumptions from your hypothesis test. Um, just as with every hypothesis test, you have a random sample of whatever you're measuring. In this case, we're going to take pairs. I'm collecting before and after values. So I'm collecting, so now said pairs them together. So I have these pairs of values I'm taking. Again, think of it as you've got this unit of observations and you're comparing multiple things from that unit of observation. And those are your pairs you're collecting. And we think of it as pairs because we're usually only thinking of two variables, but you can have multiple variables there. And then what we care about doing there is finding those differences, finding how much different are they from one to the next? How much gain did you have? How much loss did you have? What is that difference? So we care about that difference population. And so the population of the difference between the random variables is what's normally distributed. So you don't care what the original random variables look like. I don't have any care of that. I care about what that difference looks like. And so we then would have to find that difference and then go through and calculate test the normality for that difference variable. Just to be for the t-test is fairly robust to this assumption. So if your sample sizes are large, it's probably okay. If your sample sizes aren't large enough, then you want to take a larger sample. Again, usually your sample size is dependent on how much money you have to spend or how much time you have to spend. And so um, you try to make it over 30, but even 30 is not exactly the right answer. Um, but usually that's the, the standard we use these days. Okay, the calculations will all be done using technology. And um, I'm just giving them so you can see what the formulas look like, but you're gonna find those differences. You're gonna subtract the X1 value minus x2 value, and it's always one minus two. You're always gonna do it in that order. Um, you're then gonna find your mean difference, those differences, you're gonna have a column of differences, you're gonna find the mean of that difference and the standard deviation of that difference. And then you go through and find your test statistic. And then you're gonna get your p-value, which you get from, all of this will be from technology. Um, you we do have to mutate your data set to include this new variable of this difference. So you're gonna to have to actually do a little bit of work on that data set before you go and do any calculations. Um, we do this by creating a new data set. You don't call it new data set, it's just whatever name you wanna give it. And then you take your old data set, again, whatever name that is, and then you mutate it. A mutate means you're gonna create a new variable here. Call it whatever you want call whatever you want to call that difference variable, whatever works for you. And you're going to just subtract your variable A minus your variable B. Variable A is the one that's the X1, whatever you define to be your first variable, and X, a, 
variable two is your second one. And then you're going to do just a t-test because that's all it is. We now have this new variable that's that difference variable. So it looks like a one sample t-test at this point. And you just run a t-test list just like we did before. You do the tilde, your variable name. That's your difference variable name. Alternative equals less or greater. Again, you leave alternative equals off if you're doing a not equal to. And then your data equals wherever your name of your new data set is. Make sure you use the new one. Then it's before you do your conclusion and your interpretation. We can also do a confidence interval. Same ideas. You go through the exact same things. You have the same random variables. It's the same it's, and parameters. You have the same um, stating and checking your assumptions. You basically have the same calculations you would do. Um, the only difference is you read off something different from those calculations. And then you have your statistical interpretation and your real world. How we check those assumptions as a reminder that you would first say, how did you collect your sample? What did you do to make sure your sampling was a random sample? And what did you do to make sure the samples were dependent? And then you would do your um, looking at your difference and you do the um, normal quantile plot and the density plot and see if the density plot's bell-shaped and the normal quantile plot is linear. And then we can do some examples. So let's go ahead and do an example. Um, let's actually look to see if these are in fact independent or dependent samples. So the very first one we're gonna look at is you're gonna randomly choose 35 students who started at the university and 54 college students who transferred to the university and compare their GPAs. So thinking of this, if I have a student here who started at that university and I've got that student right here that student's GPA is not gonna affect anybody over here in this other sample of people who transferred in. So these are people that actually started where, I don't, we don't have a good name for them, but I guess native students to the university, they didn't transfer, they're non-transfer students. Those students are gonna be very different than these students over here. So in this case, this is um, an independent sample because one sample is certainly not gonna affect the other. And one data value in the first sample is not gonna affect any data values in the second sample. My GPA, when I started at my university, would not affect any student who came in, who transferred in their GPA. So we consider the samples independent. Another example is let's say we choose 15 students or 15 females with high cholesterol levels and measure their cholesterol level. Then we give them a new medication and later measure their cholesterol again. So now, if I'm this student who was chosen or this female who was chosen and my cholesterol was measured, what my cholesterol level was before will affect, in fact, what my cholesterol level is after the drug because it should actually be kind of tied together. They're paired together. So we consider this one a paired sample because my value will affect my value and the after sample. So my before value will affect my after value and I can talk about how different they are. I can talk about subtracting my values together. And so that's what makes it paired. And that's what you kind of want to look for is kind of ask those questions. Does it affect? Let's actually do a problem where we're actually gonna go calculate things. So we have a data set called Pulse. Um, this contains the pulse rate both before and after exercise collected from individuals along with whether the individual smoked, drank, um, or exercised regularly. Then before pulse rate is before they exercised and the after pulse rate was taken after the subject ran in place for one minute. Some people were asked to sit during that exercise and you only want those who exercise for one minute. So we're gonna kind of filter out the data set for females who are non-smokers who did not drink alcohol. That's what my question is, and who ran. So we're gonna actually create a new data set first that will filter out and just grab my data set to have just those. I'm gonna go ahead and put this data set into R so you can see kind of what it looks like. So here I am in our studio. I'm gonna type this data set in and here's my data set. 
And my data set for pulse, I just want to show you what it looks like so you can see that these are in fact paired samples. We have one individual, we have their height, their weight, their age, their gender, whether they smoked, whether they drank alcohol, whether they exercised regularly, whether they ran or sat, what their pulse rate was before and what their pulse rate was after. So we have all this and what year we were doing this in. So we have all this data that we have for this. And what I'm gonna look at is I'm gonna see whether or not my question actually is, and that would be helpful to know kind of what my question is. So let's go look at the question. My question is, do the data indicate that the pulse rate before exercise for non-smoking alcohol drinking females is less than after? Because what I wanna find out is does drinking actually affect your pulse rate? Um, and so what I want to look at is your pulse rate before and your pulse rate after for those people who do drink but don't smoke. All right. So I'm looking at in my data set here, I'm looking at the pulse before and comparing it to the pulse after. So I am looking at my variables are pulse before and pulse after. So therefore, I am looking at paired data because what this 70 value is going to affect this 71. This 80 is going to affect this 76. This 68 is going to affect this 125. So they're what we call paired because they belong together. They're all the same unit of observation. All right, so let's go ahead and we're going to first go ahead and do um, state our variables. Notice I haven't actually done anything with the data set yet. I just kind of want to know what my variables are. So when I come over here, we're going to state those. I have one variable, we'll call it X1, just to give it a name, and that's your pulse. You can do anything you want. So this is your pulse rate. Let's go ahead just for ease and call this the pulse rate before. You can do anything you want. You can do it after, I don't care. Just make sure you tell people so your reader knows which one's which. So we're gonna do pulse rate after as the, the X2. And then we're gonna have mean one That's your mean pulse rate before exercise. We don't know what this is. We have no idea what this is. We're trying to find out more about it. We don't know what it is. And then mean two would be your mean pulse rate after exercise. Now I should have been more specific because I did actually only care about females who um, are non-smoking but do drink alcohol. So I should actually be more specific up here and say this is the pulse rate before exercise of females who do not drink, who do not smoke, sorry, but do drink. And then this is the mean pulse rate after exercise of females who do not smoke, but do drink. And so I should say the same thing here. This is the mean pulse rate before exercise of females who do not smoke, but do drink. And this one is the mean pulse rate after exercise of females who do not smoke, but do drink. So you wanna be very specific here so your reader knows what it is you're looking at. So this is what we have. So we have this information. We're gonna go ahead and look at our um, Assumptions. So the next step of every hypothesis test, well, actually, let's set our assumption, our hypothesis. That's easy, a little bit easier. So state the hypothesis. So our H, and again, I like to do the HA first. So I'm going to do the HA first and then come back and fill my HO. So we're gonna, let's go look at my question is, do the data indicate that the pulse rate before exercise for non-smoking alcohol drinking females is less than after exercise? So that's my question. My question is, 
the mean pulse rate before is less than after. Now I didn't put all that information about that there's females and non-smoking because I kind of already said that. So I could actually say this as mean one is less than mean two. And so I could do it that way if I wanted to. And that way I don't have to worry about saying it because I already said what mean one and mean two were. HO of course is that mean one equals mean two. Um, we also need to figure out what our alpha level is. So our level of significance. Again, normally you figure that out based on what the consequences of a type one and type two error. But in these problems, we usually tell you what it is. And here it says the test at the 1% level. So we are knowing what our level of significance is. It's the 1%. Okay, so now we can go ahead and state and check our assumptions. So the first assumption is that a random sample of pairs of pulse rates before and after exercise of females who do not smoke, but do drink alcohol. So I forgot my after, before and after. I have the word and in there, I just got the after. So we're not just saying it's, we're not just looking at just before or just after, we're looking at that pair. And again, I can talk about these being pairs because if I go back to my data set, that's what I have. I have these pairs of values. I have these two that belong together. This is one person's pulse rate before and after. So we have that information. Okay, so we actually need to decide if this is true. So this was again the stating part and now we have the check part. So I like to put the word state there to just remind you that I'm stating it here. This is what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to have a random sample. If I go back and read the problem, I don't know. It says it was collected from individuals but I don't know if it was random or not. I actually do know, I've known a little bit more about this study than what I put here. This was a, from students in a class. So it probably is not set, not true. Um, we don't know how exactly how they took the sample. So this may not be true. Now, one of the things you can say is, well, is there enough of a difference? If there, is there enough of a randomness to be able to say it? But we can't even say that. So I would just say, we're well, probably not true. Unfortunately, that's a lot of times what happens is you don't know for sure about your data. But let's go ahead and now state the next one. And that is the population. Um, by the way, you can make sure your sample is random. You should make sure your sample is random. It's just that this taste, we don't know for sure. But if you are collecting the data, you should make sure you take a random sample. And the next one is that the population of the difference, we don't care about the actual um, before and after each individual. And we care about what that difference is gonna be. How different did they become? How much more was the pulse rate after than it was before? That's what we care about, what that difference was. So the population of difference in pulse rates before and after exercise of females who do not smoke, but do drink is normally distributed. So we wanna be able to say that. That again is my assumption. This is what I'm supposed to state. This is what's supposed to happen. You don't say here whether or not it's true. That's the check part. Here is where you just say on um, whether or not it actually, um, whether it actually happens. Um, this is just what's supposed to happen. So you don't say whether or not it actually happens. This is where you say, yes, this is what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to have a random sample. Now we check to see if it's true. So we're gonna go ahead and do that, but we need this population of the differences. So we need the differences. So this is where, 
right now I've kind of told you how to do this, but this is where we need to first filter this data set because we only want to look at women who don't smoke and are um, female and did run. We want to make sure they do more than the running group. So we're going to first take this new pulse. I'm going to copy that. That's again, just the name of my data set. So in my console here, I'm going to put the name of my data set. You can call it anything you want. I'm going to call it new pulse. And then I'm going to go, notice it became a plus because I hit return because it needs more information. So I'm going to go back over here and I told you kind of what you have to put in here. Um, you're going to take your data set you had before. So the data set you had before was Pulse. That's our original data set. That's what we brought into R. Um, the percent symbol, greater symbol, symbol, percent symbol is saying take this Pulse and use it in the very next step. So pipe this into the next step. Again, there's a plus sign because it needs more information. And the more information it needs, is this filter and so forth. I'll talk about what this filter is when I get over here. So this is where filtering just basically takes this data set here and removes and makes a new data set with just the people who smoke is no. We didn't want people who smoke, so we want smoke is no. We want alcohol is yes. We want them to be drinking alcohol. We want their gender to be female because we only cared about females in this one. And we want the ran to be that they ran. This is either ran or sat. So they were trying to do a sample, um, a controlled study where they looked at some people to running and some people sitting. We only want the people who ran. And then we hit enter. Oh, you know what? After I turn mosaic on. Always fun when you do that. This is why um, RMD files are easier because um, now I have to retype all this in again. So make sure Mosaic is turned on. Okay, so now we're gonna start at the very beginning again. I can use the up arrow to get the ones I want. So we're gonna again, create this new data set. We're gonna call it new pulse. New pulse is gonna use the pulse data set. So this line here is just to say, use that pulse data set. And then we're gonna filter it. So again, we're gonna filter that pulse data set for people who do not smoke, do drink alcohol, are female, and did the running, not sitting. And now we see we have a new data set over here called New Pulse. If I click on that, you're going to see I have heights, weights, age, but now just the gender is female. And if I go down this whole list, I only have gender is female. I also have smoke is no. There are no yes smokes. There's just no smokes. I have all yes alcohol. I didn't filter for any of the exercise, but I do have ran and all of them were running, but then I still have their pulse before and their pulse after. Great, so I have this new data set. That's the one I wanna now use. And what I need to do now is mutate that data set. So it creates a column in this data set, actually another data set that will subtract the before and after pulses. So I need to do a new thing. I'm gonna create another new data set. Again, I have this in, in right here for you know what to do. I don't know what to call it. I call it diff because I'm creating a data set that involves differences. You can call it anything you want. I'm gonna call it diff. So again, this is just the name of my new data set. I'm gonna call it diff. Again, I'm gonna use this new pulse data. So this is my new data set I wanna use. I wanna use that new data set not the other, not the Pulse original data set, because I want to only look at the females who were non-smokers who ran and drank alcohol. So I only want to use this data set here, that new Pulse data set. Again, the diff is just making the, the name of the new variable data set. This Pulse um, do, uh, percent symbol greater than percent symbol is just saying use this in the next step. And then the last step is to mutate. And we're going to mutate, and I'm going to go ahead and just grab what I have here, but we're going to mutate, and I'll explain what all these things are here in a second. So mutate means change this data set basically a little bit differently by creating a new variable column. That new column I just called diff also, 
I'm not very inventive. You can come up with any names you want to call these. This is just going to create my new data, my new column in this new data set. And then I'm going to take it where I want to do pulse before minus pulse after. It's always whatever you consider to be your first random variable minus your second one. So make sure you always do it in that order. Make sure it's always whatever is your first data set first, the first variable minus your second variable. In this case, I want to pulse before minus pulse after. And now if I come over here, I notice I have a new data set over here. It's called diff. Click on it. And it's everything I had before in that, that new one I had. But now there's a column called diff. Notice some of these are negative, And they're negative because you're subtracting a smaller number from a bigger number. I mean, a smaller number minus a bigger number. So therefore, they're going to be negative. Um, and that makes sense. OK, so now what I can do is I can do um, my density plots. So I can do a GF density. And I want the GF density to be of that difference column. My data set is this difference, difference data set. Again, it's probably not a good idea to call them exactly the same, but I couldn't come up with anything better at the time. Not very inventive. And then again, you could probably have a title. This is the difference between before and after pulse. All right. And there's my density plot. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this command. So you know what command I just typed in. And again, we're doing this check. And then I'm going to go ahead and put in the graph. So we'll go back into here. We're going to go ahead and take this graph we're going to export it. I want to copy to clipboard. So I'm going to copy to copy the clipboard. Do right click, to copy it, copy the image. Come back over here and type this this in. And there's my difference before and after. And it kind of looks a little bell-shaped. It's a little bit of a skew to us. So it kind of looks OK. But just to make sure, let's go ahead and do the normal quantile plot. So come over here. And remember, that's GFQQ. And again, with the same thing, we're going to use that difference column. My data set is that difference data set that I created. And then if you want to put a title, And that might be difference between before and after. So again, I'm just going to go copy this and post this over here so you kind of see what I typed in. Oops, sorry, wrong class. Okay. And then I'm going to go get that graph and put it in here. All right, and this looks fairly linear. There's a little bit of a, um, probably because that skewness, a little bit of a non-linear at the end, but it looks like it is. So I can now just say, um, that the density plot looks fairly linear. I'm sorry, fairly bell-shaped. And the normal quantile plot looks fairly linear. So this assumption is probably met. So the population is probably normally distributed. Okay, 
which is good because if we also go back really fast to our, our um, I want to point out something to you, our data set only has 10 values in it. So it's really good that it's not, um, that we have that normal distribution because we didn't have a very big sample in the end. Okay, so now we're going back here really fast. We now are on the next step. The next step is to, oops. The next step is to do the calculations. And those calculations are done in our studio. So we're not gonna do anything by hand here. Um, and we do a t.test. We need to put in that difference variable that we created, that diff. The data set is called difference, I mean diff. Again, try to maybe use different names than I can use. Um, and then you wanna say that your alternative equals less. Because if you go back really fast in here and look at your HA, our HA here had that less than symbol. Mean one is less than mean two. So we are less, we even use the word less here. Make sure you always have the um, random variable one and random minus random variable two. Like make sure it's always in that order. The random variable one comes first and then the two. So your mean when you're pulse rate one should come before the mean for the pulse rate two. So always want to have it in that order. All right, so we have that alternative equals less. Again, if you happen to have a not equal to, then you just leave that statement off. And now we get our calculations. Okay, so this is what we have. Um, we know we have a t-test. We know what we typed in. This just tells you what we typed in. It does say a one sample t-test, which it is a one sample t-test. It's just on that difference column. And so it is considering it a one sample t-test. The data is the diff variable, making sure you put in your difference variable here. Here is your test statistic. It's pretty small. Again, this is how many standard deviations away from the mean you are. So minus nine standard deviations away from the mean is pretty dang small. Um, your degrees of freedom is nine because it's n minus one and there's 10 data values. Um, so if you don't know your ver number of data values, you can always look at this and just add one to it to get your number of data values. And then your p-value is 3.51 times 10 to the negative six. That's a pretty small p-value. It does tell you alternative hypothesis was it is less than zero, which is good. That's what we wanted. Remember less than, the zero is because we moved the one mean to the other side and we subtracted them. And so that's where the zero comes in. And then we can now come down here and we can kind of summarize that information that we got from there. Uh, the test statistic is minus 9.2 and the p-value is 3.5 times 10 to the negative six. And then when I look at this, by the way, there is a way to do um, tech, get, putting subscripts. I just decided to use a little carrot instead of trying to get a subscript on here. Um, this value here is what that mean difference is. So all that is is just a mean difference. How much How much did your pulse rate, was your pulse rate less after, before than after? All right, so now we can go to our conclusion. Since our p-value is less than our alpha, we can reject HL. All right, and then we can do our interpretation. Our interpretation is that the mean pulse rate before exercise for females who do not smoke but do drink alcohol is less than the mean pulse rate after. Great, so we now know that. So now let's ask just a slightly different question. This time we wanna have the same question, but I wanna know what is that mean difference? So 
So I want to actually do a confidence interval instead. So we're going to do the exact same thing and do a confidence interval. Well, again, it has the exact same steps. We have state your random variable. And parameters. But we did that. We already did that. We already did this and when we did the hypothesis. So I can just say did in the hypothesis test. We also then state and check our assumptions. But the assumptions are the exact same. They haven't changed. So we already did this in the hypothesis test. So now we can get to our calculations. Our calculations we haven't already done because we did a one sample. We did a, a what's called a um, one tail test. We looked at just one side. We looked at less than. That's what's called a one tail test. If you look at just greater than, it's also a one tail test. We actually want to do two thing, two tail, basically. Confidence interval is always going to be two tail. So we're going to go with two tail here. And so um, we're going to go ahead and do the calculations again on this. We are going to go into our studio and do them, but we already pretty much have everything set up. So we're going to have that t dot test. We're going to use that difference column. We're going to use the difference data set. And we are going to have a conf level lip, um, of 0.98. Because I said in here that I want to do a 98% confidence interval. So normally we don't switch it from 95. On occasion, you might. We're going to go ahead and do one here that's a 98. OK, so coming back here. Not what I wanted to do. Okay. Coming back over here, we've got our comp level is 0.98, and then we just hit enter, and there it is. So we're going to go ahead and grab this. And here's our calculations. Again, this is the command we typed in the t dot test. It is a one sample t-test. Again, it's one sample because it's only doing it on that one variable that we created. There are two samples, but we created one variable to do this on. So that's why it's called a one sample t-test. It's on that data set, that variable diff. Again, it gives you your t and p value, but this was for a hypothesis test we're not doing. So we, don't, we can ignore this stuff. It does tell you your hypothesis, alternative hypothesis test is not equal to zero. So that kind of tells you type things and okay. And here's your 98% confidence interval, right there. So we're saying that our 98% confidence interval is between 0.69, I'm sorry, 0 .9, 69 .6 and negative 36 point, well, 37, let's say. So let's actually call it negative 70 to 36, negative 37. So we can now go ahead and do our statistical interpretation. And that is that we are 95%, I'm 98% confident that the interval negative 79 or 70 to negative 37 contains the mean difference between before and after, uh, before and after, let's say, pulse rate. Again, that mean difference is stuck out there somewhere in space. We're trying to capture it. And so we are 98% confident that that interval captured it. And then we can get to our real world our real world interpretation. Is that um, the mean pulse rate before exercise for um, 
females who do not smoke, but do drink alcohol, is less, is anywhere from 37 to 70 beats per minute less than the mean pulse rate after. So I want to talk about how I said this. Notice I didn't put the negative signs on there because I said less. Because I used the word less, I don't need the negative sign. We're already saying it's less than it's below it. We don't need those negative signs. Um, I am looking at how much different they are, how much below is one over the other. So I am looking at that mean pulse rate before and how much less is it from after. So that gives me that value. Um, I do notice, by the way, that zero is not in this interval. And since zero is not in this interval, I could have gotten the same answer from my hypothesis test just to do with my confidence interval. If zero was in this interval, then I wouldn't be able to say that I could reject HO, but here I can because I got zero is not there, which means they're not the same. If zero was in this interval, then they'd be the same. If the if these were positive, if these 70 and 37 were positive, that means it'd be more than the pulse rate after. It doesn't make sense in this case, but that's what it would mean. So you want to pay attention to those negative signs. And that's how we do a paired t-test and a confidence interval.